Good morning and uh, welcome to our webinar um, today on reduced crew operations. Um, I'm just going to wait for um, a couple of uh, seconds while people uh, join uh, join the webinar. We can see that lots of you are already um, joining us today um, and it's fantastic that you're able to take the time uh, to be with us. So my name is Amy Levesid, I'm General Secretary um, of Balpa and it's my great pleasure um, to welcome you um, today to join us. Um, we've got a fantastic panel to discuss this incredibly important issue of reduced crew operations. So I'll do a few introductions um, first of all. So I'm joined by Doji Waits, who is our fantastic Head of Flight Safety. Um, I'm also joined um, in the room uh, by Ian um, Gibson, who is our um, CC Chair of the BA Company Council. Online, I'm also joined um, by John Slaus, who is International Affairs Coordinator for the Airline Pilots Association. I'm also joined by Rich Moss, who is our Virgin Atlantic Company Council Chair, and Pete Corrigan, who's our um, Company Council Chair for EasyJet. So we've got a fantastic panel um, for you today that are going to uh, be talking all about uh, reduced crew operations. Now, um, I'm sure we're all aware that Balpa was founded nearly 87 years ago on the principle of making every flight a safe flight. And um, that founding mission uh, remains true today as it ever was. This webinar is going to discuss this impending threat that we've got with reduced crew operations. Joji's going to take us through <clears throat> a presentation of why we need to be concerned, what's being done about it, and what you can do to get involved. Um, John will also be talking about um, the international campaign. This is a campaign that involves all of our um, sister unions across the globe, um, IFALPA and DCA, um, and everyone really in the aviation industry should be paying attention to it. And um, our company council chairs who've taken uh, time out of their day to join us uh, will also be discussing some of the important issues in, ter in terms of a membership perspective, um, and how this might affect us industrially as well. Um, there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers, so please do put them in in the, in the chat. And Jojo will take us a bit through how, how the session's all going to work, and he's got some interesting polling features for you um, as well. Um, and we will be recording the webinar as well, so you'll be able to um, watch it back um, and share that with your colleagues as well. So without further ado, I will hand you over to, um, to Joji. He will take us through um, a presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our audience joining us today. Um, before I get into the, the presentation, just to emphasise um, what Amy said about um, the session being recorded, um, and also for the question and answer session at the end of this session, could I just please ask that you use the Q&A function in Zoom? So at the bottom of the screen or to the side, you'll see a little label saying Q&A. If you can use that to, to, to submit your questions, and please feel free to do that as we go along. Um, it just makes it easy for us to track, um, track those questions. Uh, there will be a bit of audience participation as well. Um, Amy alluded to that, um, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But first, let me just try and share my screen. Hopefully, and um, there's a presentation screen on there. So, as Amy said, um, this presentation will give you sort of the background uh, to reduce cooperations, what it's all about, who's pushing it, when it might happen, why it should be a concern um, for, for us, and particularly our members, um, what's being done about it. So, both within Balper and, and more globally, uh, and how how you can help, and particularly how you, our members, can help us. So in terms of the, um, the audience participation, we've got a Mentimeter um, poll set up. So if, you're, if you've got the facility to scan a QR code, then feel free to scan the code on the screen now. Uh, or if you've got a laptop, log on to menti.com, uh, and there's a code there, 52790183. So if you log on that, you should then see, um, I'll show it in a sec, a screen. So I'll give you just a few seconds to log in there. So 
So this question is really just to gauge how familiar you are generally with the concepts of reduced cooperations, um, what comes to mind when you think about this. So we'll give, a, we'll give you a few, a few seconds to, to complete um, the poll, then we'll move on. So it's interesting to see that um, a fair chunk of you are sort of unfamiliar. So hopefully this will be a good opportunity to, to learn something about RCO this morning. I'll move on. I'll leave the poll open. So if anybody you know, feels free to, you know, to, to, to submit their, their, their answers later, they can do that. But just to move on. So what is, what is reduced cooperation? So I'll, Fundamentally, at the moment, there are two main concepts um, under consideration. Extended minimum crew operations, and I'll come back to this in a second because this is really kind of the substance of the presentation this morning. And the second concept is single pilot operations. So single pilot operations, or SIPO, um, this is all about just one pilot in the cockpit and take off, fly and cruise, descent landing for the whole flight. The likelihood um, is there'll be somebody on the ground monitoring the flight. Uh, now, potentially, this could be one person monitoring several flights um, or just, just a single flight. This sort of thing is still to be still to be thought through um, and decided upon. But essentially, one pilot in the cockpit for the whole flight. In terms of EMCO, standard minimum crew operations, this is, um, and this will come first um, if this if this happens. This is aimed at um, long haul operations. So where there's currently augmented flight crew, so three, maybe four crew um, assigned to a flight. And the idea being um, that the, the flight duty period is, is able to be extended uh, and the number of flight crew reduced to just two. So this being two um, for takeoff, two for landing, but importantly, um, just one pilot during the crew segment with the other pilots taking um, in-flight rest, and, and obviously that swaps over um, according to how, how long uh, the flight is. So that's, that's the MCO. So where is the pressure coming for, from to, to, to enable this type of operation? Well, it's probably fair to say the centre of gravity in terms of um, the aircraft manufacturer and, and the regulation um, is very much in Europe at the moment. So from a manufacturer's point of view, Airbus, uh, and DASO um, are very much driving this, um, this concept forward. Uh, and the European regulator, EASA, um, is the regulator that's, that's doing the bulk of the regulatory work at the moment. We'll come on to some of the details of what they're doing in, in a sec. In terms of the actual operation, the operator side of things, the, the CFG seems to be more Middle East, Far East. Um, as far as we're aware at the moment, um, Cafe Pacific, Singapore Airlines and Qatar Airways have potentially made orders um, with aircraft being delivered, obviously subject to certification um, in, in a few years' time, so possibly 2026 onwards. So this thing, um, this is far from a theoretical thing. You know, plans are being made, um, orders are being taken um, for this to happen. So now you know who's driving it, where, where the push is coming from, what about timescales? Well, if you focus on the, the ASA uh, activity and all of the regulatory function, um, that's where the bulk of the work is happening. There's essentially been three big chunks of work, um, some of it ongoing, um, led by ASA. The first, um, an advisory group of EMCO experts. So right across, um, right across all of the stakeholders that are interested in this, um, activity, including pilots, uh, stakeholder group with the outcome, of the, uh, essentially a strategy document for ASA. They call it the best intervention strategy, um, and it outlines how they, as a regulator, um, plan to put the sort of regulatory building blocks in place that might allow RCO to happen. So that started a few years ago. Um, that work concluded towards the end of last year um, with the publication of their best interve intervention strategy document. The second piece of work, um, which was working concurrently and is still ongoing, um, is a research project. So EASA led, um, but involves a consortium of research type organizations, including NLR, for example, 
the Dutch organization. Um, and that activity um, has an objective of establishing a risk assessment framework for RCA, um, principally EMCO, but it also includes um, single pilot operations within that as well. So what framework do they need to, to, to satisfactorily risk assess this type of operation? That activity started in um, 2022. Um, it's due to report um, by the end of this year. Um, so towards the end of the, the, the final stages of that work. Which leads on to the final piece um, of work currently um, with the ASA. And this is arguably the most important. Uh, it's the rule, a formal rulemaking task. So RMC 0739, um, and this essentially outlines what, it, what would be the rule set um, to allow RCA to happen. How would the aircraft be certificated? How would the risks be mitigated? What sort of AOC would be required, for example? How would pilots be trained and licensed? That sort of thing. Now, it's interesting because that started towards the end of last year, and it's, it's actually running in parallel with the research activity. So it's quite interesting. Normally, you'd expect a bit of research activity to, to work, finalise, you take stock, and then you you make a start with the rulemaking programme. This time, it seems to be running sort of with a slight overlap. So that start, started towards the end of last year. It's really starting to sort of kick in this year, and, and it will progress through the normal um, EASA rulemaking uh, process with um, an anticipated EASA decision, opinion and decision, probably towards the end of 2028, which means you know, implementation um, could be around then or 2029. So it is not that far away. Um, and that's part of the reason why um, we are quite exercised about this and we feel the need to, to talk about it. So that's the, um, that's the rulemaking tasks. Um, so why is it a concern for us? Um, well, it's quite interesting you know, in terms of the, the main manufacturer, Airbus, uh, and the ESA, um, they see potential benefits around a much improved um, efficiency of operation. They see more resilience in the aircraft design. Um, and arguably most sort of interestingly and potentially contentiously, I would say for us, improved pilot fatigue management. So we might have a slightly different view of that. But they see that as the benefits. Um, the benefits. So in terms of the risks, um, well, we've we've identified a few. This is by no means exhaustive. But what about the workload? So single pilot operation is the workload manageable, both in normal and abnormal operations? How tolerant will aircraft systems and cockpit design be to errors? Which currently can be trapped, you know, by by the backup of a cross check with a second pilot. How resilient would it be without that checkup there? And we've seen that throwing more automation at the problem is not necessarily the panacea that um, aircraft manufacturers and regulators would like to believe. History has got loads of examples of where automated systems have been more arguably more hindrance than the help. You only have to think about the MCAS system, for example, with the seven three seven Max. So automation is not necessarily the, the solution here. It's probably fair to say there's a lack of robust technology in terms of um, the ethics and the, the ability to monitor pilot health. So how do you monitor a, a situation where pilot may be coming gradually incapacitated? Um, do the systems allow that detection? Is it possible to say when a pilot is no longer fit to fly? What about extended periods of solitary operation in the cruise with a single pilot? So having nobody to talk to next to them, no sort of external stimuli. What, what's the psychological um, effects on their well-being there? Um, there's also the risk of possible involuntary sleep being alone for so long in the cockpit. Talking of sleep, um, you know, the assumption that longer periods of rest will lead to higher quality of rest. That's by no means guaranteed. We, we already know um, through current operations that stimuli such as noise, light, turbulence, um, the prevailing circadian rhythm of the, of the resting pilot means that you're not guaranteed to get um, a good quality rest. And actually the risk may increase, not reduce as the regulator and, and, and the manufacturer might like to think. 
if you think about it as well, when you add the increased workload potentially, then possibly the, the, the risk of fatigue is, is heightened also. Now again, depending on you know, the sleep phase of the resting pilot, it could be that sleep inertia renders that pilot ineffective if there's a sudden emergency to deal with. Given that you know, it can take up to maybe 30 minutes for full cognitive uh, capability to be restored, is that likely to be too late for the resting pilot to come and help the operating pilot in the cockpit? Certainly an important thing to consider. Now this one, um, this has led to some sort of quite comic moments. Um, pilots, will, will, just like other humans, you need to take, you need to take breaks. Um, but when the pilot temporarily leaves the flight deck to have a laboratory break, who, who has responsibility for control of the aircraft? How is the aircraft um, satisfactorily um, controlled in that situation? We've seen various bizarre solutions proposed, like having controls in the, in the toilet, pilots wearing diapers, and I kid you not, um, things like that. So it, it's, it, joking aside, it's a very significant, important issue. And last but no means least, how do you ensure the security um, of the operation? So both from external threats, say cyber attacks on the aircraft, for example, um, and obviously we, we need to consider the internal threats as well. Um, deliberate intentional act of sabotage by the pilots in the cockpit alone in the cruise. Can't ignore that risk. So these are just some of the sort of the, the key high level risks. There are a lot more um, and there's activity going on to sort of delve into these issues, both from the registry point of view and also from um, the, the pilot side you know, with, with activity with the Falcon. So I'll take a pause there. Um, that's given you sort of hopefully a, a reasonable background as to what the issue is, where the push is coming from, why we need to be concerned. I'm going to hand over to, to John now. Um, he's going to talk about uh, the, the international campaign uh, and the progress being made there. So over to you, John. I'll just stop sharing. Thanks very much, Joji. And I hope it looks like the screen is up now. So, well, thank you, first of all, to Balpa for inviting me to participate in this. My name is John Slaus. I'm the RCO campaign coordinator for the global strategy to address RCO, the threat that it poses to our, to our profession's safety, if you will. This is a safety campaign brought by the pilots of the world. And you can see all the different logos down on the bottom of the screen. Uh, as BALPA members, you have pilots that are in the One World Cockpit Crew Coalition or in the Sky Team Pilots Association. You're members of ECA. You're also members of IFALPA. So this is a campaign that is already including your leadership. Now we're bringing it to the membership. And I'd like to give you an overview of what that campaign is and uh, where we're at. Uh, it started a year ago with the uh, these organizations coming together and agreeing that we needed to address this issue and represent the profession as a collective. And we've been doing that. It started with the uh, IFALPA RCO strategic plan that was developed uh, within IFALPA, but it didn't have an action plan. So the groups down below came together and said, let's, let's address this. Let's Let's act upon this. And there's four pillars to that strategic plan. The communications and, uh, and dealing with the public, uh, the media, talking directly to the manufacturers, letting them know that we believe this is a threat to safety, not an enhancement to safety. Uh, ICAO, ICAO is where the standards and recommended practices occur. Uh, that is where the buck will stop, if you will. ICAO would have to approve significant changes to their standards and recommended practices for a concept like EMCO to ever occur. And then there's the member associations, BALPA, and all the others around the world that have to come together, have a plan of attack, educate their membership, which is what we're doing today. And then how do we act on this? How do we deal with our regulator and what have you? in your own uh, country. We put together a safety starts with two uh, as uh, the, the framework of our campaign. Safety starts with two. Everything is redundant in a flight deck on an aircraft. 
including us. We have more than one pilot on the flight deck for a reason. And we're part of that redundancy. We're there to help each other and work together. You heard Joji outline a lot of these things already, but I, we all think this is fairly obvious, if you will. We think it's a dangerous idea to remove pilots from the flight deck. So I would invite you to go to this website that we are all sharing. You can click on the different links with pilot groups around the world are doing, what other member associations are doing. Very helpful for you to get a sense of not only what BALPA is doing, but what others are doing to address this in their country. You may have seen some of the campaign beginning on uh, social media platforms such as LinkedIn and Twitter, X now, I suppose. These, these have proven to be very effective. We've actually done some paid advertising. Uh, not a lot of money has gotten us quite a bit of exposure. Um, it has the highest rate of engagement and we're able to track who is engaged. And interestingly enough, not only is it people that are in our profession, it's the regulators, it's the manufacturers. They are paying attention to our campaign and what we are saying about this and how we believe this is gambling with safety. We've identified uh, events, we've done geofencing. We sponsored the Flight Safety Foundation International Aviation Symposium uh, in Paris last year. Why? Because Guillaume Ferry, the CEO of Airbus was a keynote speaker. And he was there to hear that we had our concerns about this. Um, we're concerned about how this whole process is working. You saw the timeline. We're concerned that a safety assessment is occurring at the same time as a rulemaking task. That doesn't make sense. That's not the way this is done. And uh, so we've developed a communication structure and that's an overview of, of what we've been doing to date. And we have more robust information coming in that regard. Um, I don't know how many of you know that there's a World Pilots Day every April 26th. I didn't know this until maybe 18 months ago. Um, but leading up to that in the next two weeks, we're going to have a uh, communications blitz five days in a row leading up to World Pilots Day. And we're going to talk about five significant saves. And one of them is a volcanic ash encounter that BA is a very famous event that occurred some years ago, but it's an example of how pilots were needed to solve an issue. I don't believe there's a volcanic ash sniffer in the A350 being proposed for reduced crew operations. Um, there have been, the miracle on the Hudson is an obvious one, but we have highlights of automation and systems failures that we think really highlight the fact that you need two well-trained, rested uh, pilots on the flight deck at all times. On that World Pilots Day, um, we invite BALPA members uh, to join the rest of the global pilot community to uh, show the support of Safety Starts With Two, the global campaign. So if you look at the logo, there's four stripes and three stripes, right? Captain and first officer on the flight deck at all times. Uh, we're part of that redundancy. That's that's just an idea of what the logo is. But we invite you to join the social media campaign on that day and uh, take pictures at work in your uniform with your fellow pilots and the safety starts with two logo. And if you'd like to find those logos, uh, you can do so on the safety starts with two webpage. There's a way to upload those images to your social media platforms. Uh, for you to be able to use. Different organizations around the world are updating their white papers on EMCO. In particular, instead of talking about reduced crew operations or single pilot operations, we're, we're going to get specific about EMCO. That is, that is the threat. That is the first concept that is uh, approaching. And again, highlighting that we don't believe it is enhancing safety. When we do things in, in our history, it's always been to enhance safety. Removing a pilot from the flight deck is, in our view, it, it's a hard argument to make that it's enhancing safety. Uh, so ALPA uh, in the US and Canada, ECA in Europe, if ALPA itself 
all enhancing their uh, white papers, uh, working with uh, organizations like NASA and others that have been doing research. Part of the other campaign is to, uh, if you can uh, address this somehow in your uh, collective labor agreement, um, U.S. carriers with scope clauses have taken an interesting tact uh, where I work at Alaska Airlines. I'm a 737 captain at Alaska Airlines. My airline has a requirement that every flight will be operated with a minimum of one captain and one first officer on the flight deck at all times. Um, that is a similar provision to other carriers. Delta and United have gone even further where they have a language that addresses their partner carriers via code shares or joint ventures that require those partner carriers to also uh, have two pilots on the flight deck at all times. And if they don't, if they begin uh, some sort of reduced crew operations, the uh, CLA will be open for discussion as to whether those relationships, those commercial relationships will continue. Uh, the KLM pilots took an interesting tact where they, uh, they have a veto authority if, if any kind of change in the crew complement does not enhance safety in the view of both the safety committee structure of the VNV, the Dutch Pilots Union, and KLM itself, then, then reduced crew operations will not uh, uh, occur at KLM. And this is becoming an up, upcoming uh, member focus. I've heard from the pilots at Qantas, as well as Air New Zealand, that they are making this a primary uh, focus of their next CLA negotiations. And then remember at ICAO. Uh, ICAO is IFALPA's voice. That's our voice. We are the members of uh, IFALPA. And we have 75 different panels uh, that talk about standards and recommended practices that are there to enhance safety and protect safety. And those are our pilot representatives from different carriers around the world different members of IFALPA that are there at ICAO to make sure that our voice is heard and that we uh, we do everything we can to make sure changes to standards and recommended practices are only done if it's enhancing safety. And with that, I'll hand it back to uh, Joji. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was fantastic. Let me share my screen again. So great run through as to what's happening internationally. So what's Valpa doing? Well, the first thing we really want to emphasize is we're aligned wholly with the with the international campaign with what Valpa are doing. And increasingly, um, our colleagues at the European Cockpit Association, um, yeah, the, the power of, of what we do is is amplified if there's if there's unity in the message. So very much aligned with the with the campaign. We set up our own um, internal reduced operations task force. So that's yeah, across BALPA um, function. So it's not just flight safety, all of the departments in BALPA uh, are joining towards that. Uh, we've launched a campaign website. So you've got the URL, URL, URL link up there on the screen. Um, if you're interested in, in the background and, and what we're planning, um, you can see that on the website. In terms of the campaign, um, kind of similar to, to what John described as the, the international campaigns doing targeting, different groups of stakeholders, obviously today speaking you know, to our members, um, we're engaging with a, a regulatory authority, um, we'll shortly be stepping up a campaign um, more aimed at sort of external public and get, getting the public educated on these issues um, and taking it much, much, much further. The International Pilots Day that um, John mentioned, um, we've got a, an activity um, currently planned for that. So watch this space for, for more information um, on the 26th of April. In terms of um, reaching out to, to members, um, there's a really great selection of um, assets that um, if Alpha have developed, um, ad tags, labels, that sort of thing, um, educational type material. So we intend to um, send copies of those, uh, those materials to all of our members um, in, in the coming uh, sort of month or so. So yeah, watch out for those. Um, the member comments, so as mentioned, this, this is obviously the sort of first step of, of, of a series of ongoing communication, which will continue. Um, John alluded to some of the potential industrial mitigations. I think it's quite important to emphasize that whilst 
you know, our primary concern is is flight safety here. We, we fundamentally believe this this con these concepts um, are a risk to flight safety, um, but we can't ignore the fact that you know, we're a, both a pilot association, a professional association, and a pilot union, and we'll use and we'll leverage um, all the, all of this sort of options open to us. So things like escape clauses that John described, um, our industrial colleagues will be working on those as well. In terms of data collection, um, obviously intelligence is always helpful um, when, when, when you're, you're fighting a campaign like this. Um, and we're about to embark on a data collection exercise. Uh, this is actually focusing uh, very much on the positives of what currently is in place. So we're going to be asking members to tell us stories of the things you do day to day um, as a crew, at least two people in the cockpit. To give, um, you know, to guarantee safe outcomes. So even minor little things, where you're working around your standard operating procedures, or maybe the equipment is not quite optimal. So you're working around these things, but you, you're delivering safe outcomes all the way up to the safes that John described. So the more, the more significant issues, um, serious incidents that don't become accidents. So we're going to focus on the positives. Um, with, with a survey that, that will be launched um, in the coming days um, and use that as part of our, our campaign. Obviously, we will be looking at the risks as well, um, and we've got a work stream looking at our own um, risk assessments. So this is led by EFALPA, um, running quite quite sort of in parallel with the EFSA risk assessment exercise, um, but we want to obviously do our own version of that uh, to understand for ourselves um, the risks better. So talking, talking to you, our members, how can you help us? Well, hopefully this, this session will be useful for you. You'll, you'll have a better background as to what this is all about and why it's a concern. So please spread the word, talk to your colleagues and get the conversation started around RCO. I mentioned the, the, the campaign material that will be sent out. Um, so please display those bag tags prominently. Um, they're, they're, quite a, they're quite a standout color. So. Um, when they're displayed, it, it does look quite compelling. So please do that. And, and, and very importantly, when the survey lands um, in your inbox in the next couple of days, please um, please find the time to complete it. It's not that long. It's quite short um, and hopefully quite straightforward to complete. So please do that. So that kind of that kind of wraps up um, the, the sort of background as to what's happening, what we're doing about it. Um, we've got a couple more Mentimeter questions um, to share with you, but before we do that, um, I'd be delighted to hand over to Ian in, in the room, Rich and Peter online, to just say a few words from, from their perspectives um, as company council chairs. Thanks, Joji. Uh, I think it's inevitable that somewhere in most of our airlines, uh, a financier uh, was going to ask the question sooner or later of, does our airline want to go down this route? Is there money to be saved? Uh, and is there value in saving that money? And uh, I think we need to engage from an early uh, point from right now uh, with our companies and with our flight ops people who generally are pilots uh, and counter that potential threat that's coming to us. Um, for the last decades, we have all been engaged in CRM training uh, in how to best use the entire resource of, of the cockpit and, and, and wider crew to, to enhance safety. Uh, and reducing the number of people in the flight deck clearly just undoes all of that work in one fell swoop. If you haven't got a crew in the flight deck at a time, then you can't use that resource to manage problems as best it does. So it's completely undoes the entire concept of CRM that we have been talking about for years and years and years. And I think it's a, an existential threat to, to the enjoyment of the career that uh, that many of us who are a little older have, have had over the past decades. And for youngsters coming in now, the, the concept of sitting in a flight deck on your own uh, over the, a big dark sea for two and a half hours through the night uh, really does not make the job sound particularly uh, attractive. Uh, the, the health benefits, psychological benefits uh, of the, the conversations that you have, just the pure learning of the skills of the job that you have in those quiet moments when you're just chatting idly with your colleagues uh, often bear great uh, learning points um, to be taken away. So to lose that, I think, would, would be a, a significant detriment to, to everyone's career. I think things we could do, certainly from our own perspective, 
uh, in British Airways currently. Uh, we, we use controlled rest. People use controlled rest almost routinely. It's not there as a routine measure. It's there to counter effect tiredness. Uh, and you should ask yourselves, if you're feeling the need to use controlled rest, why, why do I think I need to use it? What's wrong with my roster, my crew accommodation, my sleep patterns, uh, my rest abilities that I, that I need to actually fall asleep at the controls of an aeroplane uh, whilst I'm in the flight deck? It, it should not be necessary. It's a mitigation for I'm going to be too tired when we land. So if you feel the need to do that, it's there, it's allowable. But ask yourself why. Was that a safe scenario? And if it wasn't, should you be filing an ASR because you've had to use controlled rest to get yourself to your destination in a fit state? Uh, and it should not be a routine mitigation for, uh, for our lifestyles. Fatigue reporting, we don't see a lot of it. Uh, and yet we hear stories and I'm fairly, I don't fly long haul, but I'm fairly confident we have a lot of long haul pilots who, who are routinely pretty fatigued and yet we see very little report. So let's get uh, far more feedback for the company in terms of how our lifestyles exist currently and the levels of fatigue that, uh, that we have. And our own behaviors in, in managing uh, our own rest uh, during the flights. At the moment, we have rules for, for enhanced crew. Let's make sure we are sticking to those rules. Let's not give people the excuse to say, well, the pilots actually, they, they fly a single pilot anyway, because they, they go and take rest when perhaps they shouldn't. So let's make sure that uh, the way we use our own uh, rest rules and the practical application of our CRM actually gives a positive uh, outlook for other people in the airline who might be looking in uh, and wondering, do we actually conduct ourselves in the best way? So let's, let's portray ourselves in the best light beyond our own uh, pilot world so that other people in the company recognize the importance of uh, having two people on the flight deck at all times. Uh, and I think that probably is, is all I have to say at this stage. We're engaging uh, with BA. First conversations are taking place around this sort of thing, and uh, we will absolutely be trying to get something in our uh, in our uh, memorandum of, of agreements to, to enhance our own current midline rule status on how many pilots we have in the flight deck at any one time. Thank you, Ian. Rich. Hi, good morning, everybody. And um, thank you to all of you who've tuned in so far. And I know a lot of people are watching this on video. Um, this is a, a really, really serious issue to our industry and to our profession. And to put it in the context of recent history, in the mid-2000s, many of you of my vintage will remember there was a subpart Q campaign run by Balper to stop the changing of our flight time limitation rules. Now, many BALPA members supported that and we lobbied and campaigned. However, it didn't stop the change of the introduction of the ARSA FTLs. And that had a significant impact, particularly on my airline's method of operation, operating multiple two pilot flights across the Atlantic, long flights without minimum rest and weren't restricting it. This campaign that John is heading up is the equivalent of our generation's campaign now, and it has to be fought. The first time I met John was at the Sky Team Pilots Association conference in London in, I think it was October 22. And I remember him giving this impassioned speech about how the fact that pilots around the world had to unite, unions had to unite and campaign, but not just campaign on a talking shop. We had to take this into the public domain and put it in the faces of the press, the media, the traveling public. And without that, we will not succeed in this. So if you think this is something that other people will fight for you, you are wrong. This is the point of being a union member. This is a point of being in an association like this and in an international association. And this is probably one of the biggest things we need to take forward. Um, like Ian mentioned, I've been in pay and scheduling discussions, negotiations for the last few months. One of the things we are trying to get cemented in to our scheduling agreement is minimum crew complements to prevent the introduction of this on an industrial level. And it's a thing I know I've discussed with John and others before, is we have a regulatory campaign where we're trying to influence regulators to not introduce this, but also we need to campaign on an industrial level to put rules into place that we support as an association or as unions to prevent the erosion of flight safety. So for all of you who've watched this, please take the message out when you're in flight decks and in crew rooms and tell people to get engaged. Log on to the website and have a look at it. And for those of you in Virgin, if you have any questions about this, wait until we finish the pay negotiations, then come and ask me. Thank you, Rich. And Peter. 
Hello, everyone. Um, as Richard says, thanks for tuning in. I don't have much to add to what Ian and uh, Richard have said. Um, for the short and medium haul, uh, like we do in EasyJet, um, I think it's probably important to say that if you're under 50, this is potentially a threat to you. Um, the manufacturers are moving very quickly um, and airline management are moving, are pushing quite hard for this. Um, it does beg the question, just because we can do it, should we do it? Um, so I would just ask yourselves that, you know, to share this with as many people as you can, educate your friends, your family. Um, the union is the members uh, and use your voice because really who wants to have a four and a half hour Gatwick Tenerife um, by yourself in a cockpit and something goes wrong? Um, that's not going to be much fun and it's not going to be very safe. As Ian says, with um, controlled rest and fatigue, the key to all this is reporting. I know at BA they don't have to report controlled rest, um, but at other airlines, including EasyJet, you do. So if you use controlled rest, um, please do report it. Uh, obviously, keep reporting the fatigue as well. Um, the way to think of it is a, a healthy reporting culture gives a healthy safety culture. And the whole thrust of the EMCO and single pilot ops is that we believe that it is less safe than having two pilots in a cockpit. So use your voice. Um, remember that this is not going to happen unless we tell everybody about it and we all join together. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So before, excuse me, before we move into the, the Q&A session, we just have a, a last bit of audience participation, some questions for, for you. Bear with me. Yeah, so using um, the same Mentimeter login that you had for the beginning, we've got two questions. First one is, now you've heard the presentation, now you've heard us talk about RCO, how's your understanding now? Is it is it better, same, or, or, or worse? Jodie, just while we're um, letting people um, uh, vote, and I do love seeing that the votes change and um, while we're doing that, um, we should also um, uh, tell people that last month we met with both the CAA and the aviation um, minister, and we spoke about this, and particularly with the aviation minister, we did have to kind of um, really explain um, explain the issue. But both of them um, agreed that safety is a priority, and that and then it comes first. It was really positive. A really positive meeting. So we are getting this issue um, on on the sort of politicians' agenda um, as well. Thank you. I mean, it's a really, really important point. Um, and a lot of this, I mean, particularly at, at ministerial level, is, is an understanding type thing. Yes, yeah. it? it's really appreciating what what these risks are and, and you know what could be the unintended consequences of these things. Good. So I'm, I'm pleased that um, the majority of people that uh, have voted. Um, have a better understanding that that's great and we'll we'll continue to try and in, in improve that and, and um send out information on, on this issue so the education uh, process carries on final question um this is a bit more sort of open um if somebody was to come up to you later today and, and say reduce the operations what words would come to your mind so feel free just to use free free text um you should have up, up to three options three choices of words to use uh, and what it will do is it will populate a word a word cloud um, based on your responses. I'll give you about a minute or so to do that. So when we make the um, the recording available um, on, on the website and YouTube channel later, we'll, we'll put up the results of the Mentimeter polls as well, so you can see um, what the final picture looks like. Interesting to see words like threat, safety, risk, dangerous, loneliness. That's yeah, you know, that's that's a theme we've we've talked about quite a bit this morning. Inevitable, finance driven. Just, just a few more seconds and we'll then 
move on to the Q&A. This, this poll will still be open. So again, for the remainder of the, uh, the, the session, uh, you can add to those um, that word cloud. Okay, well, thank you for um, the attention so far. I'm gonna hand over to, to Amy now, just to run through some Q&A. Yeah, so we've had quite a few um, questions um, uh, there, Brian. I'm going to take the chair's privilege, if that's all right, and ask um, a, a question myself. And it's one of the things that um, I'm I'm quite intrigued about, and um, and Joji and John might in particular um, uh, have um, knowledge around this, around what actually is the economic case for doing this? What is the business case for doing this? Because it seems to me that while there's saving partly on salaries, um, uh, there, which you can see, surely there's such a lot of expense involved in terms of putting in the extra technology and increasing insurance costs and all of those sorts of things that would come with having this. Surely there isn't actually a business case for doing this. What what is there out there, Joji, that would mm. that they've actually used or Airbus have used to say this is why the airlines should be doing this? It's a very good question, um, and it's it's something personally I've, I've not seen. Um, I've not seen a, a sort of a robust justification for this, other than some sort of quite quite loose assumptions around numbers of pilots um, and the associated costs, um, and and quite a big assumption around um, what would a, what what would facilitate this. Um, so the fatigue discussion that you know, bit we mentioned earlier on fatigue. So I've not really seen um, a, a justification. I don't know, John, if if, if you've had other experience internationally on this i think i th i think the uh comments that i've heard from airbus's presentations more than anything is this is meant to address fatigue and uh you know controlled rest you hear the term controlled rest and it's you know uh, oh that makes sense but it's not it's an emergency situation to use controlled rest anybody who's using controlled rest uh, should be filing an ASR report every instance, okay? There are fatigue issues, significant fatigue issues. Flight time, duty time standards need to be better. And we shouldn't be pushing pilots to limits on what's going on. That doesn't enhance safety. And, and Airbus's solution is, oh, well, if you're fatigued and you're using controlled rest, this is even better because now you're going to get better rest, okay? So better rest is taking your pilot out of the flight deck is their answer to a fatigue issue. Well, that's great unless something immediately happens while that pilot happens to be resting. Okay. Um, we should never try to use controlled rest or emergency. It's, emer it's an emergency situation. That's why it, it, it should be defined as such and reported as such. Um, so, you know, the other things I've heard is that considerations will be uh, higher medical standards, no exemptions on medicals uh, in order for this to occur. What kind of flight time requirements will there be? Is this going to be a two captain operation only? Or are you going to be leaving junior first officers with lower flight time by themselves in the flight deck when something goes wrong? There are so many questions that are unanswered. And as I mentioned earlier, the safety assessment is being done at the same time a rulemaking task is being done? Who does this? That's not how safety has been enhanced over years in aviation. So, you know, I don't know what the business case is. It hasn't been heard of, but every time I hear about this, I think of more training. Uh, where's the mentoring that you that occurs when two pilots are in the flight deck, the discussion, uh, the alertness, the interaction with the cabin attendants and security and cabin safety, and all these things that occur, we have a system built around two pilots in the flight deck. Uh, the verification of uh, fire handles being moved or systems being shut down is a system that is done and rooted in two pilots working together. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's some questions unanswered. But if you think about all of this, uh, I don't know where the cost savings is. I don't know where the business case is. I think we should focus on having a robust pilot supply and making the pathway better for people to become professional pilots than trying to figure out how to automate pilots out of the flight deck. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, there's there's a lot of questions. So, I will um, I will try to uh, to get on. So, we've the first, um, the first question there, which I thought was um, uh, quite a good one, was, um, how have the regulators determined that RCA will result in improved pilot fatigue management? And they've they've put in that quite nice phrase, scientific or speculative. Um, so, do, again, has there been a lot a book, whole body of evidence around this, Joji? So that's it's a very good question. So um, as far as I'm aware, there's, there's been no justification for that. So again, it's a sort of almost like a design assumption um, by having more, more ability to, to rest for longer um, and reduce fatigue it is a foreseeable benefit, but it's yet to be de demonstrated. Um, this is where the, the risk assessment work that um, EAS are leading um, with, with the, uh, the consortium, that's that's where those sort of things will be, we, will be drawn out. But as John, John and I have alluded to many times already, um, it's interesting that that activity is still happening, yet the rulemaking task has started. So it's almost like the, you know, it's, it's a working assumption, but without the data um, or the justification to back that up. Absolutely. Does anyone else have any anything to add on that, Ian? I would just say, I mean, it... <laughs> On the face of it, if you have more rest during the flight, then in theory, it, it's a reasonable assumption to suggest you will be less fatigued on arrival. What that doesn't take into account is the longer time you spend on your own in the flight deck, the greater your fatigue is going to come. And there is no chance of doing a rational scientific experiment to work out which of those has the greater benefit versus disbenefit in terms of being on your own for a long period of time versus being able to have a lie down for a long period of time. Uh, it would be entirely speculative to suggest that, uh, that a longer period of rest will instantly give a, a reduced level of fatigue. And surely the like the cumulative impact of, of working like that for a long time is going to have um, uh, is going to change the results and also you know Changing something now where we've got very experienced um, uh, experienced pilots who work in the, the situation that they've got and people have uh, learned, um, learned a lot by working with each other. If then suddenly you've got pilots that are working on their own for a great period of time, they're going to be less skilled by the very nature. It's going to change absolutely everything, isn't it? So it's kind of, it, it will change. The evidence will change over time. Um, there's a the question in um, uh, in the Q and A here, which is something that I that I find very um, sort of a, a dystopian sort of um, thought, and it's around crew monitoring pilots from the ground, but it, it kind of makes me feel a bit um, a bit funny. So these um, is augmenting uh, cockpit crew using monitoring pilots on the ground who are connected to the flight deck via a data link being developed. So Joji, what what about people on the ground that are controlling the planes. Yeah, so obviously with, with the, the advances in um, drone, RPAS, UAS type technology, that, that sort of remote piloting concept function um, technology is is evolving rapidly. Um, so it's, it's, again, not unreasonable to, to see this being associated with this type of operation. But uh, you know, as Ian alluded to, it's, yeah, and others online, how, how effective and that monitoring be really lots of time spent um, on on human factors related issues CRM how you know how a true problem you know problem solve an issue and how that works effectively because you you're there next to your colleague how do you get across that situation awareness where one person's flying and one person's on the ground how effective is that that's assuming that the links all robust and work perfectly. If they're interrupted or if they're cyber attacks, those sort of risks, and um, that's that just adds another layer of, of, of threat to the to, to the situation. So you know, you've got a long, you know, arguably a long, a long way to learn how effective these things can be for drone type operations, let alone um, operations carrying large numbers of passengers um, long distances. So yeah, it's it, those sort of technologies exist. That they're evolving rapidly. Um, but certainly the, you know, the soft skill side of things that have been developed over decades um, in commercial aviation um, need to be thought through, um, if indeed it can, if, if it can actually work. And of course, that is one of the threats as well, isn't it? Because we have the issue of, of spoofing and yeah. um, interference and uh, 
on the ground and that's going to make that presumably the pilots it's going to make it far harder harder if you're on your own and that happens to um to Absolutely. you um, so we've got, um, I think this would be a really interesting question for, for Ian and Rich and, and Pete to answer. Um, so Haley's asked an, an observation on the reduced fatigue claim. How can I, particularly as a captain, rest in a bunk at the back of the aeroplane when a junior first officer is on their own in the front for two hours? And I think that that goes to this human um, nature of knowing that uh, you, you, you've left a colleague um, on their own um, completely. How would how would you feel in in those circumstances, Ian? If I come to you, there's your smiling. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm smiling because the, the answer to the question really is uh, you can't. Um, it's much as we we all trust our colleagues and everyone is is trained to the same standard. We are all aware of uh, levels of experience that exist uh, in ourselves and those around us. And I think it would be an uncomfortable place to be. You will be lying there listening for every weird movement at the aircraft, every strange noise and wondering what is going on. I know that um, when I've trained very junior people on the on the A320 and it takes me quite a long time to pluck up the courage to go to the toilet for a minute. Never mind, go and have a sleep for two and a half hours. I think you, you absolutely raise a, a very valid point and I don't have an answer to that question. Richard, Pete, how would, how would you feel in this scenario? I think from my perspective, um, it's one of the things that John mentioned earlier was that these operations, will this be a two-captain operation? Will there be a restriction on the experience levels of the person who's left behind? And these are all the things that haven't really been answered to um, my satisfaction yet in terms of that, um, you know, we've introduced low experience pilots into a long haul operation in Virgin and they're good, skilled, trained people, but they lack real life experience. And if you are going to leave a single person in the front of an airliner for an extended period of time, that can't be somebody without years of experience of dealing with just different situations, whether it's a weather thing, whether it's a technical thing, whether it's a diversion thing, whether it's an in-flight problem with passengers. Um, it takes years to build that. And there was another question in there as well about how do I gain experience as a first officer to become a captain if there's nobody sat next to mentor me? So where we go with this whole thing is interesting because there are different views. One is that if you can safely remove one pilot from the flight deck, you can remove all pilots from the flight deck. The other side of that is a lot of manufacturers or people in the industry say that ability to remove pilots completely does not yet exist. Therefore, you can't just remove one. So you need to sit there with two pilots. So I would say I would be uncomfortable resting with a 180 hour MPL license holder sat in the right hand seat flying along um, without knowing that there was somebody else there with experience. Thanks. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry, go on, Pete. Sorry, I was going to say, I'll echo those. I mean, it's all to do with experience for me. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a cold. Um, yes, if you've got a very experienced FO who's about to get their command, <clears throat> yes, you, I'd probably be very happy to go and have a lie down. But as Rich points out, it all becomes a bit chicken and egg. If, if the captains are going for a sleep all the time, you're quickly going to run out of experienced FOs. And then where do the new captains come from? Where do they gain that experience? <clears throat> so it is part of this existential threat to, to the job of being a pilot, because as we know, it's all about experience. And if they're relying on the experience of a pilot to, to, to operate as a single pilot, then you'll run out of experience at some point. Absolutely, and that was um, that was one of the other questions that I was that I was going to come on to. Um, uh, there is, you know, how do you gain how do you gain that experience? Um, so there's a really interesting question here about um, Boeing and the FFA, the FAA, sorry, um, and they that's that's shown the failure of manufacturers and the regulators being a bit too close um, together. So, what does this tell us about how we stop RCA progressing? Joji and John would probably be be best place to answer these yeah. these ones. Yeah, so question from Adam. Very very good question. Um, so I think it it gives us I think it gives us the impetus to really challenge quite strongly um, any assumptions. So design assumptions come back to that again for how 
a system or a new procedure process can actually mitigate the risk. You know, give us, you know, give us, give us the data. Show us the studies that have been done to to justify that assumption. Um, how, do, how would you go about proving in in, in service um, that those assumptions, the data that you've got to back them up, actually translate into the real operation? Be very um, very demanding of that. Obviously, the, the issues we've seen with with with, with Boeing, the FAA certification oversight of the, the MCAS system on the seven three seven Max. Arguably, you know that the, again the data that the justification behind the assumptions. Weren't, weren't properly demonstrated internally, let alone having some sort of scrutiny from outside. Don, what, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I just, I, there have been a couple of groups that have gone to Airbus and Airbus has tried to show off this technology and guess what's happened on both instances? It didn't work as advertised. The engineers were all of a sudden going, hey, that's not the way this is supposed to work. So they're nowhere near proving this. And we all know automation fails, right? We all know that at some point in time, everything's going to fail. It does. It happens. Um, there's a NASA study that's uh, coming out that there's we have all these regular flights, all these flights that are just normal flights. In those normal flights, 20% of them require pilots to intervene to the automation to get the airplane to respond accordingly, right? So this happens regularly. I don't, I don't know how the FAA and Boeing, their relationship, obviously it went awry. It was given too much independence to, to Boeing, and now that's trying to be resolved. And look at how that slowed down what's occurring. Does that need to be looked at at Airbus and IAZA? I would suggest that this is a pretty close relationship right now. And there have been uh, discussions on this by ECA and programs that have come out and said, look, we need to slow this down. Everything needs to remain independent for the betterment of safety. That's what's paramount to this. Uh, I'll leave it at that, I guess. Thanks, John. Um, so there's a question um, uh, uh, in the Q&A, which, which deals with one of the, a really difficult issue, and this is um, from Graham. Um, how do the regulators plan to address the sorts of issues arising from the German Wings event? Um, Joji, we were speaking about that just um, just last week, weren't we, with the... Um, uh, um, in the NEC meeting around when we were discussing reduced operations. Um, it's an important issue, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and arguably um, mitigations that have been put in place, it's been rulemaking, new regulation implemented since since German Wings. Um, arguably some of that has gone a reasonable way to mitigating that risk, but it's predicated on, on the current mode of operation. Um, it's when you start to remove bits of that out of the system, if you like. So when, when you start talking about taking taking pilots out, so you're leaving single people more exposed. Um, that's when obviously the, you know, you know, the the mitigations that have been put in place since since German wings start to lose you know, their, their value and their effectiveness. Um, which is why we, we really need to highlight that risk. Um, although it's clear, yeah, clearly throughout our, our community, it's an uncomfortable um, thing to do, but it it, it is a risk. Um, so let's not make it worse by removing, you know, removing the mitigations that have been put in place. And absolutely, and as, um, as we had some of the comments um, before, being left on your own for extended periods yeah. of time um, may likely, uh, you know, it may cause you to um, feel those expressions of loneliness and things like that that uh, might exasperate some of the feelings that you've got. And there's a really interesting um, uh, question here from, from Kevin, that says this feels like an experiment on the part of aircraft manufacturers to prove the viability of removing um, pilots from the flight deck altogether. And this is one of the things that I've um, I've said um, uh, myself. You know, this feels like this um, is something that the manufacturers are wanting to see. Can they do this without thinking, should they be doing this? Um, but uh, Kevin said, I'd be interested to know um, how the flying public would feel to learn that they were unwittingly involved in such an experiment. And that's like a really interesting um, 
uh, point, I think it's around how we unite with with the public, mm. because I think most members of the public would not like the idea that there is just um, for, for extended periods of time, just one pilot on the flight deck um, and because they can see what, you know, what the pilots do if some in the event that something does um, uh, does go wrong. So I thought that was a really, a really good comment. John, is there a lot of work that's going on to involve the public in the campaigning? Well, that, that is part of the one of the four pillars of our, our plan, right? When, you know, we're a tr we're trusted professionals. Uh, when we stand up in front of passengers and describe maybe there's a mechanical issue with the aircraft, people listen to us. They respect us and they look to us to safeguard them and their travel. Um, and that's part of this plan is communicating to the public why we think this is reducing safety. This is gambling with safety. I think the question is spot on. Uh, how can we get to this point when we haven't even proven that automation uh, can't be hacked? There isn't a security or safety issue associated with that. The assumption that everything only happens when it's a takeoff uh, and climb or approach and descent phase of flight. But in cruise, nothing ever happens in cruise. So we can lose one of the pilots at that point in time. I mean, that really does go to the communication with the public, explaining this to them. It's the reason we've got the safety starts with two uh, uh, page up there. Um, it's not just for us to learn and share the information. It's to share the information with the traveling public, the media, and explain the issues that we have the concerns about and how this is reducing safety. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I, I really do think this is a, a point where we are united with um, with the public. And just as you say, say John, um, uh, a pilot is one of the most trusted professions and it frequently comes up as being one of the most trusted professions in, in polling um, that has been done. Um, there's a question on here that's sort of making me chuckle a little bit. Do you ever think that there would be a, a, a robot plus a pilot, which I'm sort of <laughs> in my head got... A, um, as a sort of like number five from Short Circuit. So if anyone remembers the film from the 1980s, um, sat there with a hat on. Um, uh, do we think that we would ever have that kind of technology, um, Joji? I mean, we've spoken about technology on the ground, controlling and um, somebody could potentially control more than one flight at a time. Do we think that we would have more automation um, on the flight deck? And is this just, we're just creeping down a road um, of just trying to get more and more automation. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you can say you have you have that in the cockpit already, sort of behind the scenes. Um, and when it works well, and it it works to make pilots' job easier, better, allows the pilots' performance to be improved. And you can argue it's it's, it's a good thing. Um, well, I can I imagine something physical in the cockpit? Probably not. <laughs> um, that's just that's just too weird, isn't it? But um, in terms of more more artificial intelligence sort of generated automation behind the scenes, then it, it feels like that's that, that's the sort of the direction that um, <laughs> manufacturers and you know, the technology companies want to go. But it's, it, it comes back to that understanding of you know, how this automation works, what, what happens when things fail, um, are the behaviours kind of expected, predictable, you know, how, how does a human interact with them and sort of thing. Um, those, you know, those those are the challenges that have existed for for, for many years, um, and will continue with these new systems, but in a more only in a more um, kind of extreme way. So, no, I don't I don't expect anything to be there physically, but yes, I would expect um, systems to be to, to be developed in that way and, and be behind the scenes, uh, and that's that's a that's a critical area, but yeah, which we would we'd have a very strong interest in how those are developed how we you know how humans interact with those systems can i just say something generally about automation um pilots have never been opposed to automation and i hope anybody listening is not taking this as a that we don't accept automation or that we don't want enhanced automation in the flight deck there have been significant safety enhancements um in my 38 years of being an airline pilot that I look back at and I marvel and I and I appreciate 
how those items have enhanced uh, safety. For me, enhanced ground proximity warning systems in the rural terrain of Alaska is a, an unbelievable enhancement of safety. Um, nevertheless, uh, we have procedures if it fails. We have uh, procedures on how we go missed approach if some of the, the GPS signals fail. So the, the point is, is let's bring on the automation and let's use it to enhance safety. But the other thing that's interesting is when you add automation, it also increases the need for more training, more understanding. We can't let our, our, our flying skills, the hand flying skills, be degraded because we have automation. That's because we know it's not going to work at some point in time. We also, so many people don't even realize how many things can be broken on an airplane and yet it still can be operated, uh, right? So there's things that just go with this. And, and I think the thinking about the future is really hard. I think the best thing to do is stay focused in the present and what is the proposal of the present? And this is a proposal that is, is uh, you see several holes in it that haven't been addressed. Um, you know, if something goes wrong, apparently there's supposed to be wake up the pilot that's sleeping. Okay, how does that occur? Does that work? You know, how is there time enough for the pilot to climb out of the bunk and get back into the flight deck to assist the other pilot? You know, I mean, do you leave an engine burning for five minutes while the other pilot's uh, coming back because the procedures are that you shut down an engine with a trust and verify mechanism. That So I think if we stay focused in the present, there's going to continue to be automation and that's great, but um, we work with it, not against it. Absolutely, John. I think that's a really important message, um, isn't it? Because automation and those, those sorts of things can be for the good. And um, we should be doing that to aid and assist um, pilots to be able to make better decisions, more informed decisions, um, and be able to um, to do their job better. But it should always be that pilots are in control. We've got two pilots in control um, on the flight deck at all times. Um, and of course, that, that idea of that you can just go and wake the other pilot up in the bank in the bunk, and then they can come along to the flight deck. But that doesn't um, that might not always work. They might not be able to get back to the flight deck um, safely. So it, it could just fall apart um, there and then, depending on what the problem is. And um, so there's a question in here which is a bit um, uh, of a difficult one. So as um, uh, so we've got um, a pilot here. So I'll read out the the, the question. So. Um, it says, as a young pilot, I think it would be naive to think that there would never be any form of reduced pilot um, operations. Um, uh, it's quite a long, um, a, a long comment on there, but it, it's sort of asking, um, do BALF have any views on the best way to embrace this evolution in the future? Obviously, we're trying to to, to stop this um, stop this from happening um, altogether. And are we, but are we thinking about if it did happen? Um, would the conditions change for the remaining um, active pilots? Would that increase um, pay um, and the like? I mean, I think our focus needs to be on stopping this from happening because it's not something that we would ever want to bargain. You know, pay can't be um, uh, a replacement for the safety. But I wonder what the panel um, think about that sort of um, the feeling amongst young pilots that potentially that there's an inevitability about this. How do we how do we feel about that? I mean, I'm I'm generally quite a positive person and, and know the um, the power in unity, and particularly when we're all all of uh, the pilots' unions are working together. And um, just as 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 John set out um, right at the beginning, and um, that we can um, stop this from happening, and we've got a, a, a lot of um, power in our professional voice and in our industrial voice. And um, but there is possibly a sense amongst the, the younger pilots that this might be um, an inevitable um, uh, feeling. How do we how do we counter that view, I guess, is probably a good way of, of phrasing it. John, you've turned your mic off. Um, how do you how do you think that we can counter the view that this this is inevitable? Well, I, I... It's just so presumptuous, right? I mean, I, I I think it goes back to my previous answer. A technology is great, and and maybe there's a date in the future that somehow can be proven that it's safer to not have pilots. 
I'm not convinced of that in the near term or in the medium term. But uh, that we can't think about how do we deal with that then. We have to think, we have to work with, with what we know now. Um, I, I think that's the right approach. I'm not for selling safety. That's what the question presumes is, oh, well, uh, let's just pay the pilot more and then they'll be for it. I, I, I don't accept the premise. Um, no, um, no, I agree. Um, I mean, we've got um, uh, Rich and, and Ian and, and Pete on here as, as company council um, chairs. I mean, I don't think that members would would ever sort of accept um, that as part of a, a pay deal or anything like this. And actually, what we what we're seeing, we saw this in the um, in the TUI pay deal, and um, they've just done is that they've got wording in their agreement around um, not moving towards reduced crew operations. Yes, I, you have to look at the, the premise of the question is the, the inevitability of it and whether you accept that as, as being a, a fact or not. And I think at this stage in, in the process, uh, our, our drive very much has to be to make sure it's not inevitable that we do counter it and we do advertise and, and reinforce the value of having two pilots in the flight deck at all time. Now, I'm not going to live to see the day, I suspect, but no doubt there will come a time when there are things whizzing around the sky with no pilots in with other humans sat down the back. Uh, and, and that you could argue is perhaps inevitable, but it, it's longer off into the future. And I think the important thing right now is to protect the, the existence of, of two pilots in the flight deck uh, for as long as we possibly can. Uh, I, I don't think one is inevitable, actually. I think zero is inevitable, but I'm not sure that one is. I have to say I agree with Ian on that. And I see Paul Copeland's made a comment on here that one means none. Um, and the technology does not exist at the moment to remove a pilot and leave it as one. In the future, as Ian says, there is the possibility of pilotless aircraft, but I don't believe that it will meet acceptable levels of safety given the current technological aspects. And if you look at the sort of some of the questions here about artificial intelligence, robots, they're great and they progress, but they don't possess the cognitive ability that humans do. At the moment, they rely solely on the data that's contained with them. And all of you will know from years of flying that there are situations that you will have never encountered before that you deal with. And that's because of the way humans are made and that cognitive ability. Until there's a way around that, I cannot see a reduction from two pilots down to zero. And we'll be wrong to accept that it is something that could be introduced in the near future. That's a really um a really good um point, Rich. And it, it reminds me a bit of the um the, the brilliant bit in the film Sully, um, where he speaks about when they're um, uh, talking about you know the simulator tests that they do and, and all of this, and then he talks about how his um you know 30 years of experience led up to um, the moment of him being able to determine what to do next and it's like a, it's a really good um speech and really encompasses that there's nothing that can replace the experience of a pilot um, and it's all of that real world experience and all the rest of it and of course all of those um the information that any technology would have would be put in would be inputted by a person so it would only be through experience of pilots that would be into a system so you know how it would be able to react in um, in an unknown situation, um, is um, is anyone's um, guess? So I think we'll we'll move on to um, to the, the the last question here, um, and it's just on on the regulators. Do we think, um, and this is um, probably a good question um, um, for for Joji and, and John. Do you think that the regulators will will sort of go for this? Do you think that they will do this, or do you think that they will um, uh, uh, put a stop to it? Um, particularly if it can't be proven that uh, that you know the safety aspects um, can be mitigated and, and made at least as safe as it is now. I'll ask to John to sort of maybe get the, the FAA or international view, and then I'll maybe say a few words on, on on the UK. Yeah. Well, let's take it in two steps. So. Um, in order for a technology like this to be flown around the world, and the intention here is for this to be on an A350, uh, that's a long haul aircraft. So in order for this to be implemented efficiently uh, for uh, the purpose that Airbus describes, 
uh, they must get ICAO to change your standards and recommended practices. If that does not occur, then the the aircraft can't be flown in this method uh, outside of a country where a regular regulator may have uh, approved this. So, um, so take a step back. The first regulator that uh, IAZA or that uh, Airbus is working with is IAZA. Um, that's the the rulemaking task at hand. Um, I'm not sure where that's going to go. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how IAZA says all these boxes have been checked we've proven all of this and and i don't know how they prove anything when when uh you know you're talking about a whole new way of certifying an aircraft um so i, I don't know what their strategy is perhaps it's hey if we get iaza to approve this they'll just take it to ikeo and drop it on the ikeo desk and they look, we did all the work for you. You don't have to consider the safety risks. Um, we have pilots on the uh, rulemaking task at uh, IAZA that are members of the ECA. Uh, we have observers from uh, Boeing and FAA. Uh, we have talked to them in the US. Uh, they are gonna be actively engaged. Um, interestingly enough, I think Boeing's position has been I don't see how you do two pilots to one pilot either. The comment is really more, it's either two pilots or no pilots. And when is that in the future? I don't think anybody has any idea. So, you know, we'll see. I think it's up to the regulators to come back and go, if they approve this, they have a lot of proving to, to do before uh, convincing people that they're actually enhancing safety. And remember, that's the standard that we have always gone for is enhancing safety not maintaining a level of safety. Yeah, <clears throat> I could probably echo a lot of what John said there. I think um, a critical point of making things better, not just maintaining the status quo. Um, I think in terms of the UK, from, from, excuse me, from the conversations we've had, it's it's reassuring that um, both sort of at a governmental level with conversations with the minister and a regulatory level, it's been quite clear that you know, the, the safety case that would need to be justified has to be very robust. Um, whether existing systems are able to demonstrate that, um, particularly in the incapacitation of pilot case, um, so we, we talked about that sort of earlier in the session. So the safety case would need to be robust. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily an assumption that if this is pushed through one regulatory regime, it will automatically apply in another, and certainly in, 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 not in the UK, now we have that independence of um, regulatory responsibility. But it comes back again to ALPA, ECA, if ALPA, other member associations having the voice um, to, to influence um, these rulemaking activities wherever they happen um, and make sure that our, our concerns are put across there so that you know we, we, we are able to challenge these safety cases if and when they, they are actually made for real. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think that that's um, the, the, the big point is we should always be striving um, and the, the manufacturers and the airline stores be striving to make things better and um, not just trying to um, replicate what we've got now, but not as good. Um, we should be striving to, to, to make things better and, and looking at um, tech and the development in tech to how we can aid and um, improve the pilot's role um, and help pilots make better informed decisions, but always with two um, pilots um, in control on the flight deck. Um, so we have um, kind of come up right up against um, our time, and I apologise because there's loads and loads of questions in the Q&A that we didn't get um, a chance to, to ask. So we will try and um, do um, answer those um, uh, offline. Um, thank you to everybody um, for, for joining us today. Hopefully um, you've, you've learned a lot more about the um, about RCO and the threat of RCO than you, than you knew at the beginning um, uh, of the webinar. And hopefully you'll be able to share um, the video, which we'll send out afterwards um, with your colleagues to really and um, really show that this, this is the issue of our time and this is the issue that we need to be an absolutely united and a strong voice um, for pilots and that Valpa 
and um, really needs to be um, leading the way with with our partners, our sister unions um, across the globe um, on this this issue. Um, and you know, as I said right at the beginning, we were founded on the principle of making every flight a safe flight, and that remains true today, and um, as it was as it was eighty seven years ago. So um, thank you so much to um, all of our panellists um, for all your fantastic um, contributions and for joining us um, today. Hopefully this will be the first of many um, webinars that we can do on this um, on this topic. I feel like this is going to be, I'm going to do a plan that we're going to be in this for the long haul um, and, and uh, really fighting, um, uh, fighting this um, uh, through to make sure that we always um, we have that safety starts with two um, going on. And I'd just like to thank everybody um, for joining us today, today, taking the time to come in and being so engaged and asking questions. Um, and as I say, we will try to um, uh, try to answer those um, offline. Uh, the video will be shared with you, so please do share that with, with your colleagues. Um, um, and also watch out for um, future um, materials and activities. As Joji said, we've got materials coming um, on their way to members. We've also got um, uh, it, events planned for the International Day of the Pilot um, on Friday the 26th. Um, so do watch out um, in your inbox um, for that to, to come through. But thank you so much for, all, uh, for joining us and for all of your engagement. And um, this is an incredible... Um, uh, this is an incredible moment for us to be united across the globe with all of our uh, sister unions and, and uh, partners in the aviation industry. And it's fantastic that you've been able to be part of it today. So thank you very much.